Worthington switches it to Harks on the right. That's a good effort. Oh, what a tremendous goal by John Harks. His first ever in English football and one he'll remember for the rest of his days. 13 minutes to half time and one of the goals of the season has given Sheffield Wednesday the lead. The American World Cup player came forward and just decided to have a crack. And what a crack it was. To beat Peter Shilton from that range, it's got to be some shot. It was. Welcome to a special edition of Owl's AmeriCast, Sheffield Wednesday Opinion with an American Accent. There will be a regular show this week covering the Derby County and Bolton games, because we can't just keep taking every week off when we don't love the results. But we did put together a special episode featuring an interview with a bit of a uh, Sheffield Wednesday and American legend, James. We did indeed, Jeff. Um, and uh, and what everybody's about to hear is uh, is probably one of the highlights of my Wednesday fandom, to be perfectly honest. Um, I've just had the pleasure of spending an hour speaking with someone who was a huge part of, uh, of hooking me onto being a Sheffield Wednesday fan in the early 1990s. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think this guy needs much of an introduction, but a true uh, American soccer legend, uh, certainly a Sheffield Wednesday legend, the scorer of one of the greatest goals I've ever seen scored in football. Um, and also the, um, the the kind of the sporter of one of the most uh, celebrated haircuts in uh, in early 1990s British football as well. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think I need to say no more of them to say that you're about to listen to an absolutely scintillating hour of discussion uh, with John Harkes, um, occasionally moderated by Isles Americas. And can I just tell you, like, this has been such a, it's like trying to catch a big fish at the end of the day. We've been trying to, we've been speaking to John for the past two or three years. Well, I have been speaking to John the last two or three years about the New York Owls. Then when we did the Owls Americas, and he was the first person we got in touch with uh, to try and get on the, the podcast. He's obviously a very busy man. He's always been very gracious. Uh, we've tried to get on a few times and it's fell on through, but he's always kept in touch. He's always been very nice and very responsive to us. And to finally land him and to uh, have such a great chat with him he's just such a very nice guy it was so natural uh we were very nervous which we probably met, uh, uh seem a few of our um uh, <laughs> our questions uh, but it was just immediately put to ease he's a lovely guy couldn't thank him enough and uh, i think you're gonna absolutely love the next hour of uh, of our chat with him so um yeah jeff roll it Let's be honest, you don't really want to hear us recap a incredibly dull 1-0 Wednesday win over Bolton. And since our 1991 episode went over so well with our Wednesday at listeners, we decided to double down with an early 1990s legend. And of course, this is the Owls AmeriCast, so it's an American twist. It's only John Bloody Harks. John, welcome to the show. Hey guys, thank you so much. Great to be on with you, finally. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Now, this chat almost didn't happen, as you said. We've been trying to work this out for a while. And the last time we were set to record, we had to postpone because you were announced that day as the head coach of the Greenville Triumph, a brand new team in the USL. So congratulations. And how is that going, building a club up from scratch? Uh, well, thank you. Um, yeah, it's been it's been good. Um, you know, I, I've said many times that it, it's always good to, to find, uh, you know, good good people, good leadership that you want to start a club with. And, you know, when I heard uh, Joe Irwin, uh, the owner down here uh, in Greenville, South Carolina, um, he and uh, Chris Lewis, the president, had, you know, approached me uh, months and months ago, about April, uh, and just started picking my brain on things. My daughter, Lauren, is a captain on the women's soccer team here at Clemson, and Greenville's only about 35 minutes away. Um, so we had caught up at a spring game in April and, uh, we were talking, you know, just about building the club, what it was like. And then my experiences in, uh, Cincinnati as well, and the success that we had on and off the field there. Uh, and, and just realistically, 
it was more of like a kind of giving them a, a heads up on, on what to avoid and the pitfalls and things like that. And, you know, more like a you know, sort of like a, a consultant in a way. Uh, but over a period of four months, it led to more serious conversations in depth. And uh, and I had interviewed a, a number of clubs to get back out and, and manage again. And uh, they just seemed to be at the top of the list in terms of everything taken off the boxes. So for, for me... Uh, excited to be here, um, new adventure for sure, um, and ready to get going. So we go from the uh, the current end of your story to the beginning. You hail from Kearney, New Jersey, just across the uh, the Hackensack River from Patty, who's in Secaucus. But uh, unlike mm-hmm. Secaucus, it's produced a staggering amount of U.S. national team players over the years. What's so special about soccer in that town, and how do we bottle it? It's definitely in the water, boys. You know, you just you don't want to drink that stuff. But I could tell you, uh, it makes you tough. It's gritty. Uh, growing up in Jersey is just, you know, at that time too. We we had such a special um, time, and, and we didn't realize it when we were younger. But you know, all of our fathers, you know, that we all hung out together, young kids. You know, from the age of God, I started playing at four years old, I think, in the. Uh, you know the the local rec teams down the down the, the just down the road and and changing at the Thistle uh, uh, at the Scots American Club and sponsored by Thistle Fish and Chips. I mean, it was like I was growing up in Little Scotland, and there was a, a lot of UK um, uh, immigrants that had come over, and and most of them were all their fathers, and they played football before, and so they wanted to just teach us the game the right way, and so they create a great culture and an atmosphere and, and, and we just played and, and uh, every day in Carney, we played every single day. And, uh, and that whole surrounding area, you know, you talk about Sea Caucus and, and Hoboken and Weehawken and, and Union, New Jersey and Clifton. And, and there's so many quality players that have come even down South in New Jersey. I, you know, when I was younger, I didn't like to give credit to the South Jersey because that was our rivals, you know, through a club in our high schools. But, you know, a, a lot of quality players that have come out of Jersey in that New York area. And I, I think it's just because of the culture that was passed on and, and having this kind of society where we we grew up knowing like what what the, uh, you know, the Sheffield Wednesdays of the world, the, the Arsenals of the world, the Liverpools, and, and knowing the history of the game in the UK. And, and, and that was something that pushed us on to the next level, I think, and just created that passion from an early age. John, you mentioned uh, the, the the Scots Club is called, right, in Carney. Is yeah. that still owned by your family? Are your family still involved with that? We don't own it, no. It was just, uh, it's a social club, um, you know, members of it for sure. Um, okay. My dad and my brother, actually, I caught them in there on Friday. Um, <laughs> phone call, they were just uh, starting the first pint at 3.30 in the afternoon. <laughs> um, it has the best jukebox there is known to mankind, and uh you know, they've just got the shuffleboard and everything else in there. It's just a really good social club that that for us when we were younger was a gathering point. And, and yeah, the club's going strong. Um, you know, I think the, the clientele may, may be a little bit more diverse in, in terms of its ethnicity and background, but they're still it's packed and a lot of people go in there. Um, the old timers, you know, which uh, they have the golfing membership there as well. They have the coaches in there from Thistle FC and you know, just a lot of us that graduated from that environment, and we come back, and that's where we meet up. Then we definitely make a pilgrimage there, chaps. Yeah, I think so. I think it's long overdue. Definitely. It's a bit disappointed you boys haven't been in there yet for quite <laughs> fun. It's, de- it's definitely nearer me than it is from Jeff and uh, James, but we'll, uh, we'll hopefully make a pilgrimage there, because uh, I know there's quite a few bit of uh, paraphernalia about yourself on the wall as well as in the there. I think there's there's a, a lot of history, yeah, for sure. Um, not just on you know, myself, but you know, on the history of the game, and you know, some of the players that had come before us in our generation. And even when you talk about Carney and the history right now, Tom McCabe is a historian in the game, and uh, his son goes to Notre Dame, Tom, and uh, he was doing a, the documentary on on the the growth of Carney and and just where it was. God, you, you go back to the history in the 1930s and 34s and the World Cups, the early World Cups. There's so many players that came through Carney um, and, and just played and competed. And whether you were on, you know, the social clubs, the German-Americans, the Scots-American, the Irish-Americans, whatever it may be, it's a great history. And in that social club, uh, one of the benefits is it's like a little museum. So it does give you that bit of history and that, that, that culture that's there. But it also is, I'll tell you one thing that you're going to love. 
is that you can go in there and buy 20 friends a, a round of pints and it will cost you 10 bucks. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Oh, right, I'm so I'm so they just dis- they discount everything. I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's great, you know. It's a good good place to be. <laughs> we'll head from New Jersey to Virginia where you went to college, but you actually forewent your senior year where you played under uh, future national team coach Bruce Arena to join the the US men's team at the Seoul Olympics in 1988. Now we sort of in this country I think think national soccer sort of began in 1994, but you know, before the World Cup here, like what was the scouting of a of a national team soccer player like in that era? God, it's scouting. Whew. I don't know if there it was more about, you know, that was the old days of um, you know, really the beginning stages of the Olympic development program. And uh so I mean you were you were fortunate enough to play, you know, your club ball and then also your high school was very strong back in those days and it really took precedent over the club which is kind of reverse role now with the academies that are going on in the U S um, where nowadays they're banning you from playing in the high school. So back in those days, it was like high school, you represent your, you know, your state team of New Jersey. Uh, you would go to ODP. You would also, you know, compete against other states in Virginia and New York and Philly and uh, Pennsylvania and everything else. And then, you know, it was it was more about like condensing that next group and rising up to the next level. So it would be like a regional team, and then you know, uh, eventually that would lead into sort of like a, a Olympic festival sort of thing. And I remember after my first year at UVA, I was event, uh, invited to compete in the Olympic summer festivals that they had there, um, and it was more like a north, south, east, west four teams competing against each other. And it seemed to me at the time that that's where they selected the Olympic pool. Um, and so I competed in that um, for the East. Uh, we did very well. And then, you know, by the time the third year came around uh, and the Olympics were there in 88, uh, Bruce Arena had sat me down and said, look, there's, you know, there's a big movement now going on with the U.S. Soccer Federation. They're making a huge push and, you know, the right people are involved and they want to really um, get together the best players in the country so that they can qualify and get back to the world stage there was an absence of 40 years uh prior to the 90 world cup and uh, certainly from 1950 uh where we beat some team i don't know what that team was called but i think it was england but <laughs> anyway um, I, forgot, I forget too do we yeah, I know everybody forgets that in England. <laughs> and the papers actually wrote 11 nil, like the England one or something like that. But it, great stories back in those days. And, um, you know, it was it was a more of a process of like understanding at that time, you know, God, what do you what do you do? I mean, I've gone to school now. I want to be a graduate. I want to get my degree, but I want to still play football. And the next level was to get, you know, to the national team, to be fair. And it's kind of unheard of, I think, around the world that a national team was going to get together and contract you to play. Um, but that's kind of desperate measures um, that was going on for desperate times. And we needed to get a national team together and more on a full time basis. And we were paid very little money. Um, but at the same time, the players and the desire and the hunger to get to that national team, and get back to that World Cup was there. So I think they, you know, they galvanized everybody together and the energies and, and God is there and through the qualifying stages, long story short, you know, we, we beat Trinidad and Tobago away from home 1-0, which was kind of against all odds. And, um, you know, there we were qualified and getting to the World Cup in 1990. So it worked off. It, it paid off. After bringing the U.S. national team back to the world stage, you tried to do the same with Sheffield Wednesday in 1990. And at that time, it was still relatively unheard of for an American to play in the European leagues. So how did you find yourself playing for a second division club in Northern England? Did Wednesday seek you out or vice versa? No, it was vice versa. It was through a lot of different connections. Uh, I happened to be playing uh, the U.S. team. We would come together for weeks at a time and train in Florida and and sometimes uh, the West Coast, but very rarely. We would keep mostly on the East Coast uh, due to weather and stuff like that and as much travel as we could in, in the limitation, but, and, uh, of course with costs as well. But, um, in between those stages, when we were going in with the national team, they were saying, look, we need to get games for you guys. We need to continuously have you fit and play. So at the time was the American soccer league and, um, the New Jersey Eagles was there locally, but the Albany Capitals had requested that I come up and play with them. So basically 
kind of a strange situation. I was I was training, you know, on my own uh, with a lot of my you know friends, my local boys, and and Carney and Thistle. Uh, we'd be doing pickup games, and then I would travel out on like a Thursday night, fly up to Albany. Um, Mike Windisman and Brian Bliss uh, from the old national team were actually on that team as well with me. And, and we would train Friday, play a game Saturday, and fly back home Saturday night or, or early Sunday morning. So it was it didn't happen often. It wasn't like a, an occurrence of every weekend, but it was those games in between. So it was kind of difficult, and, and I think it was very difficult for the club as well and the players that were already there um, because you got somebody coming in infrequently and and just playing and, and taking the place of another player so we always felt kind of awkward doing that but one of the famous players that i ran into that was playing for the albany capitals at the time was a former england that's a national striker you guys know who that was for the capitals yeah i'm not sure do you know james i <laughs> i'm i'm absolutely clueless john you've, uh, you've <laughs> caught us on that one um yeah, that his first name was Paul, and he's a commentator for the Revolution. Oh, it's it's oh, I know you mean there. No name's gone. You have to put that in misery. You are. I didn't catch that second name. Did you, did you tell me his surname. Um, yeah. So you don't know his last name? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So I, I said he said Paul from so Paul, an ex England striker playing for Albany Capitals, right? Yeah, Paul Mariner. Paul oh, Mariner. Paul Mariner, yes. He's, I saw him on uh, TV as well. He's a pundit too, right? Yeah, that's what he's commentator. Yeah, pundit for uh, the New England Revolution. Right. The MLS. So, yeah, he was up there and I, I just was training and I'm looking up and I see this. He, was, he had longer hair at the time and like like a ponytail or some type of band around his head. I was like, who that? What, who's this guy? And I'm like, then I got up closer with him when I got a drink and I was thinking, wait a minute, I know who this is. So I asked the manager, I said, is that Paul Mariner? He goes, yeah. Came in to play a couple of games. I was like, what the hell is going on here, by the way? What a quality player. So you never know who you run into when you're playing football back in the old uh, U.S. days. Uh, but, yeah, it was good. And, and we try to train and play as much as we could and be competitive. And, and so, you know, that was the process there back in the day. We would fight and claw our way to play as many games as we could in any possible place and state that we could as well. So, John, how did how did Paul Mariner end up leading you to Sheffield? That's well, um, that's the connection that, that we're all uh, we're all kind of keen to hear, given that we don't necessarily yeah. remember Paul Mariner from our youth. Yeah. So he he was actually saying to me, like, why don't you get over to the UK and your family Scottish and this and that. And there was a guy running the club at the Albany Capitals uh, named John Simpkins and, and his brother Jim. And they had connections somehow to Sheffield. I don't know how. But they asked my dad if I would be interested in going over. And I said, sure. And so I went after we qualified. Um, I went in that January window of 1990. And I did a trial basis with Tony Miola. And um, uh, the gaffer, Ron, actually, at the end of the trial, asked me to stay on for the remainder of the season until the end of May. Um, as naive as I was at that time and very young, uh, and the fact that it was very, very valuable that we qualified for the World Cup and we lined up so many games to play and qualify and get our chemistry together, I declined and said I wanted to stay with my national team and train with them over the next six months prior to the World Cup, which Ron Atkinson's jaw dropped and hit the desk when I told him that. So as the first American, I kind of declined him at first, and then said to him that, you know, he said he'd be commentating in the World Cup and he would keep an eye on me, see how well I did, and then possibly invite me back afterwards. So that ended up happening, which I was very, very fortunate. And um, regardless of the fact that we lost all three games, um, that he liked what he saw. And so I went back there and started the trial basis again and just to prove myself and the mentality as well as the ability. And over a long period of time, it worked out. Long stories, but um, yeah, it, it finally worked out. And uh, I was a Sheffield Wednesday player. And in all fairness, John, I think we can uh, we can all excuse you um, as an American landing in Sheffield in January for wanting to wait until the summer to come back. Um, do, do you remember your first impressions of Sheffield as a city and uh, and kind of what struck you as uh, as the differences from uh, from you know obviously a guy growing up in New Jersey and with the, uh, the the worldly experiences you'd had up to that point? Well, no, I mean I kind of liked it actually. I thought it was a gritty 
to uh, town and the, and the people were very friendly uh, initially and got along with the boys. And certainly when you're on cloud nine, when you're at that age and you're thinking to yourself, like, God, I could do this for a living. Um, so that that really kind of over exceeded anything else, uh, regardless of how cold it, it was in Sheffield or whatever it may be with the weather conditions or or, or the sun disappeared for days and I never saw it. It didn't matter because it was just football. And that was my life. That was my passion. And, and that's what I wanted. I think to be fair to, to anyone listening in Sheffield, what they think of as cold is nothing compared to a northeast winter. So uh, so hopefully you were pretty well prepared. Um, yeah, exactly. At, at, at this point, we're obviously going to have to turn our attentions to, um, you know, where your Wednesday story started. Um, and it's fascinating hearing you talk about, um, you know, your first interactions with the club being being early in 1990. I guess that was obviously before the club uh, were relegated at the end of the season, which um, is literally where my Wednesday fandom started. I, that was my my first game was uh, at the end of that season when we lost to Nottingham Forest and, and obviously went down into Division Two. Um, but you joined back in the summer and then were part of what is, I think, in all Wednesday night's opinion, one of the greatest seasons in our long history, 1991, uh, 1990, 1991. Um, and it was a pretty incredible season for you as a, as a footballer. Um, I mean, you scored not only the goal of the season against Derby, but but probably one of the goals of all time um, against one of um, England's legends in Peter Shilton. Uh, obviously, you became the first American to play in a Wembley final in, in the 91 uh, Rumblers Cup final. And um, and in that game, uh, got one over Alex Ferguson and, and beat Man United. Um, not to mention, obviously, promotion that followed at the end of the season. In that litany of, of success, um, how, how do you pick a highlight out of all of that? You know, how, how was that season for you and, and what stood out as, as kind of the defining moment of the year? Yeah, I mean, look, I agree with you. And it was uh, it was a lot to take in. Um, you know, I was I was 23 years old. I'd already competed in the World Cup, uh, which was an eye opening experience for me at that time. And. You know, um, I think a lot of that helped prepare me to to push me on and have that perseverance, you know, to compete for Sheffield Wednesday. And, uh, you know, look, sometimes injuries come about and Roland Nielsen, who was my roommate at the time, got his knee injured. Um, the gaffer asked me at that time if I've ever played right back, which I quickly answered yes, which I never had before in my life. <laughs> and uh, because, you know, you, you, you just look for any opportunity you can, you know, and. And so, look, you get on the pitch and, and you know, as you say, God, the stories and, and the games and everything that that really that competition was just unbelievable. And, and I craved more. Um, but to be in such a great group of, of talented players, um, but also just good characters, good people that got along off the field and, and on the field and pushed each other and supported each other and that was brilliant for me i mean just to be in that environment was incredible so seven months um as you say i mean you make your debut um you score a goal this season against peter shield the most capped uh, player in england and then you find yourself at wembley walking up the steps getting a winner's medal against manchester united one of the teams that i had you know looked up to as a child you know and, and those were dreams that you had the, you know, you have the posters on the wall of these players. I mean, I, I looked up to Brian Robson. I was like, you know, Captain Marvel. I was like, this guy is unbelievable. And then, you know, I, now I've got a chance to play against him in his club. So for me, it was just, honestly, I mean, I don't know if you can write that story. I, I just don't know if you can. I mean, it was to happen that quickly um, and all of it just come at you. Not to mention the fact that at Wednesday, like you said, the atmosphere in the stadium, the home ground was pretty electric. Uh, it was a special time. And I think a lot of the away crowd knew that as well. So most traveling away fans did want to come to Hillsborough because it was it was very, it was loud. Um, and the passion was there. And the supporters were brilliant. So, look, they help push you on. And it's it's not false. I mean, it, it's a true you know statement. They really do push you on and you feel it. Um, and I felt it there. And over a period of seven months, man, what a dramatic first start to the, uh, to getting into the Premier League. Um, adding promotion to it was a massive bonus as well. So obviously you mentioned a few of the, the stars that you, you uh, play within that team. What were um, some of your closest, like you said, you got a very close uh, group there. What some of your closest friends that you had in that group, who did you hang out with the most? Who was the, the, the most fun? Yeah, I mean, like I said, Roland Nielsen was my roommate, so I got along with Roly really well. Uh, um, John Sheridan, uh, I clicked with Johnny really well. Hersty, Colton Palmer, 
Phil King was absolutely hilarious. But, uh, you know, looking up to Nigel Pearson at that time as our captain and leader, I, it was sort of like a big brother for me. You know, I had a, a brother, very uh, my brother Jimmy is very similar to Nigel. He's about six foot four, big center back. So I saw a little, a lot of similarities in him, you know, plus the fact that Nigel liked to beat me up every once in a while. <laughs> um, so, I mean, look, there was, there was just so many guys. I mean, there, it really was. I mean, you could turn everywhere you went, you know, Nigel Worthington, funny, you know, um, every one so, of them, you know, all these players were great. See, I got close to me. Sheridan quite a bit. Sorry, sorry. Uh, Pearson three always looks really stern and serious. Was he not that in the, at all in real life? He was, but he did. He was such a competitor. I mean, he was feisty. I mean, I can remember when Ron Atkinson joined at the training just to have, have a laugh. He was doing like a, a five aside or whatever, and he joined in and stuff. And Nigel went right through him with the tackle. And <laughs> I've never seen anything like that in my life. And I, I stood there like, what are you doing, son? I was like, Jesus, what's happening here? And he picked him up and just said, hey, if you're out here, you better be able to take it. Let's go. And Ron Atkinson was like, all right, fair enough. Love it. Let's keep going. But I've never seen a big tackle like that. So he was very <laughs> intense on the pitch. But he did have a good balance to him, a good sense of humor as well. He really did. Uh, um, good captain, good leader. Uh, I think he's a good manager and uh, certainly a, a good friend to have on the team. And, and John, if I can pick up on the point about good management, I mean, we, we, we're obviously going to roll through the, the litany of your experience at Wednesday, but the end of that 1991 season was was also the end of Ron's tenure or first tenure of, of managing Wednesday. Um, yeah. And, but you've just alluded to the, the immense camaraderie you had in that squad in that first year that you, you joined the club and, and obviously some of the incredible characters in the dressing room, um, you know, not not uh, wanting to list the names, but we could we could go through, you know, true legends uh, along with yourself of, of Wednesday history. Just just how much do you attribute to Ron Atkinson for building that squad, um, the, the, the temperament and the, the nature of the way in which you all gelled as players and, and the way that led you to, to the successes you had? Uh, I, I would give all the credit to Ron Atkinson, without a doubt. Um, he, he had this unique skill set to recognize talent but also recognize character within players um you know a lot of my management approach today um is very similar and and and, but he knew when to push you and demand more of you he also knew at the right times his 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 social awareness was fantastic so he knew when to crack a joke and have a laugh and wind up players as well and i think that kept us together that's you know regardless of of the results that may may have come and i do remember us going through a rough patch just prior maybe right near my debut actually um we had just after that because we we couldn't score a goal for like four or five games prior to that and i just come back into the i just come into the side and made my debut i think it was old oh god two two maybe um, we played Swindon hold home and away in a cup game. Um, and we had kind of fallen down the table, but he still knew how to keep everybody up and, and, and positive, enthusiastic. And he demanded a lot from you, but he put, he knew how to, it was a tough love that he had and he knew how to get, he knew how to pick a team as well. He knew the players and how to put them together on the pitch, you know, positionally and stuff like that. So I, I give it all the, all the credit to him. To be fair, I mean, they had good staff with him that gave some balance and, you know, but, uh, you know, once in a while he would give the freedom to the players to just, you know, sort out themselves. And I think that gave ownership to the players and, and that's what players love. And I, and I think the fans uh, loved it just as much as as you guys in the dressing room, um, because it, it was just so easy to gel with with you all as a as a playing squad. Uh, and and you mentioned earlier on the atmosphere that created at Hillsborough and, and the momentum that built for the team. Um, obviously, nine, the following season, ninety one, ninety two, Ron moved on to to Villa, but. Um, we had a, another amazing season, um, first season back in Division One, and, and the last season of Division One before the Premier League was formed. Um, you know, a, a year in which we ended up finishing third. We obviously qualified for Europe. 
um, some amazing standout moments. Um, Jeff was alluding earlier on that we were reminiscing the other day about the uh, the three uh, the three two victory uh, against Manchester United at Hillsborough that October. Just just one standout in a really memorable season. I, I guess kind of the question I wanted to ask you here is, you know, given that that was pretty much largely the same squad with a couple of additions um, that Ron had built, j- just how close do you think you guys came to winning the league that year? Um, and and you know, kind of, are there any points at which you you truly believe that maybe we we were there that league championship was there for the taking? Yeah, I think I think we were very close. Uh, I think a lot of us, um, you know, certainly when you know we came down to as a group discussing it and having those conversations and setting that as a goal for us. I mean, I think you know that was realistic. It wasn't you know something that couldn't be obtained. Um, it was measurable. And based on the talent that we had, sure, we were an up and coming squad and we surprised a lot of people, you know, obviously, you know, in that, that 1991 season. But um, I still think we always thought that we were going to win. You know, I think that's the, the, that's the one character trait of good teams, right? You go out and they all talk about the swagger that you have. And yeah, it would have been, it would have been special to win the league for sure. Um and uh, yeah, I think it was always in our grasp. Uh, we had the talent, you know, it just didn't work out. But I mean, you know, we're, there were certain times where I think we all kind of looked at each other and said like, hey, this is, you know, this is possible, you know, for sure we can do this. But, you know, look, it's not easy. And you guys know that it's difficult. Um, you know, even when you look back at 93 as well, we got into two cup finals against Arsenal. And, you know, unfortunately, we walked away without a win in either so, you know, to go to Wembley that many times, you know, even when we played the semifinal against Sheffield United, I mean, God, as an American player, I was at Wembley five times in three years. I was thinking, what's going on here? But, you know, that, you'd be lucky. In the old days of football, you'd think about if you had a 10-year career as an English footballer to get to Wembley once would be special, never mind that many times. So for me, it's like, look, yeah, you never want to settle. You always want to be the top and you want to win things. And I think we always kind of had that mentality that we could do it. And it was just, unfortunately, we fell short sometimes. You, you, you may have fallen short, but you, you gave it an incredible go and you got very close. And, and incidentally, those um, those four or five trips to Wembley were pretty much single-handedly kind of the response of, uh, of catalyzing this um, very young Wednesday night's um, absolute adoration for the club. So um, thank you for, for all of those uh, those moments and and for setting us up for the fall that we've uh, we've experienced in the last 25 years. Um, <laughs> but just kind of staying in the oh, staying in the 90s for a little bit longer. Just, it, very it's, English it's right there, very there. English. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> the present tense. Um, with all of that success, John, um, you know, obviously you, you're getting a huge amount of coverage in the UK for, for being, you know, the first American to um, to be part of a you know cup final team in '91, the first American to score um, in, uh, in in a Wembley game in the uh, the the '93 uh, final against Arsenal. Um, were you getting attention from the, you know back in the US? Did, did did you know kind of particular understanding of what was happening in English soccer at the time and and your role and and you know was Wednesday getting players as a result of that as well? You know, it's a good question because, you know, back in the day, you know, my dad, when I first got to Wednesday, was listening to the games on shortwave radio. So when you talk about, honestly, I mean, you you think about the technology today and what's going on. You can watch a game on your phone. You can turn off games that you don't want to watch. Back in that day, it was hard to get coverage in in the States. And uh, I feel like that was an issue, you know, and, and a lot of people have said this to me as well. They're like, God, I mean, if we had the same visibility when you were at that club as you do today, it would have been so much bigger and better f- just for the U.S. because it was difficult. Like, you know, I remember, um, you know, just having print writers from the States once or twice a year would go over and they'd be like, yeah, I'm coming over just to write a story, see what's going on here. And I was like, oh, OK. And, and so they really hadn't seen games or anything like that. So it was, for me, it was kind of new. And it was at a time where there wasn't a lot of exposure and a lot of coverage back in the U.S. Um, there was a number of us overseas, maybe six or seven U.S. players in, in different countries um, that were making a living, trying to make a living and, and continue you know, chasing their dreams and, as being a pro. And uh, I think once in a while you would get coverage from uh, national print like Soccer America. Um, but not a lot of TV coverage at all, at all. And I still think to this day, you know, my son Ian, my two daughters who play as well, Lauren and Lily, um, I don't think they've seen many of my games that I've played over there. 
I really don't. And uh, so it's interesting. They, of course, they see the goal I scored against Darby, um, but there's there's many others that are just like, yeah, I'd love to see more footage, you know. And they did. They didn't. Back in the day, a lot of people just didn't see it. It wasn't exposed. And if it's helpful to them, John, um, I've got quite a lot of your footage uh, on VHS tape back in my mom and dad's uh, <laughs> attic in Sheffield. So, uh, so I'm sure we can sort something out if they uh, they want to see a little bit more of the uh, the is time it on the in PAL Sheffield. System? Is it on PAL? Do I have to convert that over? <laughs> <laughs> it might it might be beta, beta max, but I'm sure we can uh, we can come up with something to uh, to help you out there. I mean, look, we, we we could literally talk all night about your your time at Wednesday, but we we do want to also talk to you a little bit about uh, kind of your, your views on American soccer and bring us all up to speed. But just as transition, I mean, two two um, questions mm-hmm. in kind of you know reflection of those incredible couple of years. You know, is the one moment that really stands out for you um, across your 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 time playing at Wednesday? And secondarily, um, is that different to going out on a night drinking with John Sheridan? <laughs> is that, wow. Um, God, I mean, geez, even when you think about it, picking one moment that stands out is difficult. Um, you know, scoring at Wembley is, is pretty special, uh, especially against a club with, that, with rich in history like Arsenal. But not winning that game didn't make it as special as it could have been. So winning against Manchester United um, w- was really, really special for me. And uh, I think that was one of the top moments that stand out. The individual accolades, you know, scoring against Shilton, getting goal of the year and all that stuff is it, great. And I love it. It's fun. But when you do something together as a team and you actually compete and you win as a team, God, you get to share all of that. All the work that goes into it is shared and collaborated throughout the whole group. So I think getting the the League Cup winners medal against Manchester United and going in as an underdog and and having Ron Atkinson as our manager at the time who used to to manage it there was so many great storylines that crossed over there you know that he used to manage it at uh, at uh, Manchester United as well so it, it that was pretty special to be fair um, but my whole time at Sheffield was special and again I just fell in love with the people in the city and everything about it um and and maybe a lot of people don't want to hear this on this uh this wednesday brought you know podcast but um i made a lot of friends with the sheffield united players to be fair and it was kind of unheard of at that time um but every once in a while we would go out post games and we'd run into some of the players and there was a big rivalry there in the city and god i never experienced anything like it i thought it was absolutely brilliant uh, so for me to like buy a pint for a player on, on United was kind of unheard of. And I do remember doing that uh, in Josephine's nightclub. And, and some of my players were looking at me like, what are you doing, Harksy? And I was like, well, we compete when we cross the line. But we're off the pitch, we're all footballers. We all love the game. So it was, it, it was just an interesting time for, for that city. And uh, I was very fortunate to, to be one of the, the many great players players that have come through there and enjoy that experience at that time it really was special and uh i'll never forget it 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 it, it really set me on a path for, for my career it was brilliant i can't see john sheridan standing for that actually giving buying pints for the uh, blades no he, can't, he, he can't remember that. for it actually he would call me a shit house and he would say hey chris <laughs> packet come here you hey chris packet and then uh <laughs> yeah Shez, yeah but he was all right as, as Shez, you know, once he had about eight or nine pints, you couldn't tell what language he was speaking, so it was hard <laughs> to understand him. Uh, but he could still put the ball on a dime for you anywhere you wanted. But great, great player, man. What a fantastic player. And uh, he's, he's good. You know, he's, he's had some great stints as a manager as well. Um, he would always have a wise crack. You know, he's always winding up the boys, and they always have a go at me as being the Yankee lad. So, uh, you know, it was through endearment. He said, if I don't wind you up, it means I don't care about you. I said, okay, I get that. Thanks very much. You took a bit of a bit of a kind of a crash course in English and Irish sense of humor, I assume. Yeah, I think it was him. It was either him or Carlton or Kingy who actually my gear hung up in the middle of the ceiling in my first training session with Sheffield <laughs> Wednesday. And then somebody else cut the holes in my socks and when I went to put them on before I ran up for training. Uh, so it was all good winding up all the time. And that's what made it fun. It made you included, you know, in the group. So, John, we have a section in our pod called Dispatches from American Soccer. And as you were one of the main reasons a lot of our American fans got into Sheffield Wednesday, apparently from our very unscientific survey, pipped only by people's love of owls, we wanted to ask you a little (laughs) bit about your time on the, uh, it's scientific, your U.S. national team experience. 
Uh, you were part of the spine of the USMNT for almost a decade, played in two World Cups, and were integral to the formation of the MLS. But the 1994 World Cup with the U.S. as the host nation is widely credited as being the year the country stood up and really got into soccer. Uh, do you agree with that assessment? And what did it mean for you to be playing in those games on home soil? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I just want to say anytime you get a chance to put on your jersey to represent your country is pretty special and, and you take it with pride and, and never, ever take it for granted. So I was lucky to do that 90 times and the 94 World Cup hosting a, a World Cup and being able to you know represent your country at that time was incredible, absolutely incredible. And it goes beyond, you know, your everyday thinking. Um and it was it was great. I mean, I think we woke up a nation you know, at that time, um, and it was needed. It was definitely needed. We we were sort of a country that okay recognized that we were back at the world stage in '90, but it was only a small percentage of core soccer fan base that was really into it. Um, so to host it in '94, especially with the melting pot, you know, different ethnic backgrounds that we have here and the diversity that's here. Uh, you know, look, they, they knew what they were doing. And I think maybe to this day, it's still the most populated World Cup ever. Um, sold out mostly at almost every stadium, if I'm not wrong. Um, and the atmosphere was tremendous. So for fans to see us on the stage at that level here in our own, co- in our own country was pretty amazing. And, um, you know, from the first kickoff in Detroit in the Dome, uh, to going out to California uh, and, and playing against Columbia in the second game and, and upsetting them and winning that in the Rose Bowl, um, you know, uh, to playing against Romania again, and, and we lost 1-0. Um, I just remember the reactions of the crowd when we did well. Uh, against Romania, I hit the post and almost equalized, and uh, just a gasp in the crowd. It was everybody was for us. So it, it really did wake up a, na- a nation and it set the platform for development, but also from a business side, from a, a business mainstream in this country to be recognized and to have, you need corporate, you need people tying in and, and, and want to spend the money, to be fair. And, and that was the catalyst. That was the platform, uh, if you will, to, to really galvanize and, and kick off Major League Soccer in 96, because uh, still a lot of people didn't think it was going to happen. Um, and for, you know, for a lot of us that got bought back into this league and I was with Derby, but I was on loan at West Ham at the time in London, living in the townhouse. And they were like, you know, Sino Galati phoning me up and saying, Hey, we want to buy you back. We want to get, you know, the league going, we want to get players from all over Europe, bring them back here. And, you know, they will be spread out throughout as designated players or whatever and signings. And we were like, Oh, is this really happening? So I think it just really as I said before, woke up a nation and so important in the timeline and the history of the game here. Because without it, I don't think we would be surviving like we are today and, and excelling, you know, in terms of the growth at Major League Soccer at the USL level, uh, in the USL Championship level, and now the new structure in the league, USL League One that uh, I'll be coaching in with Greenville uh, Triumph Soccer Club. So I don't think you would have seen the growth. No chance without that here. So thank God that that did happen. I don't think it was just uh, also um, how the U.S. reacted to it. It's how the world reacted to it, too, Ajahn. Because I, mean, I can remember the U.S. in that tournament, and suddenly you, you're being taken serious for the first time. You, had some, you played some good football. You defended well. The, the crowds were amazing. And you had characters in that team, which everyone could love. I mean, Lalas with the blazing red hair, uh, yourself in midfield. It was just a really good, lovable team. So I don't think it was just the U.S. taking notice. It was the world taking notice for the first time of U.S. football ball. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think and you need, you know, from a, a sales point, you need uh, the marketing, the images of the players. You know, you even had Kobe Jones with the dreadlocks and, and things like that. And Lalas with a guitar and... So look, you you get that. There's the imagery that's there that helps sell the brand and and keep it alive and keeps it fun. Uh, and yeah, you want to draw people in. So, like I said before, you know, it was a passion of of the fan base that that really wanted that that had that interest that wanted to you know kind of tie in. But we did have the characters. I agree with you. We did, and we had the players that could stand out and do well um, and compete. And again, we learned quite a lot from '90 World Cup. Yeah, we lost three games, but we we just grew in experience, and uh, 
we, we were able to step back, reflect, and see, you know, how we needed to improve as a nation. Uh, Bor Milutinovic, the head coach at the time, uh, did a fantastic job of just instilling confidence into us uh, and that self-belief. And so, look, you're playing against Colombia in that second game. We got the draw against Switzerland in the first game. Uh, against Colombia, Pele, who I was a ball boy for at the Cosmos, um, hugs me in the tunnel before we go out and play. But here's Pele at the same time picking, you know, Colombia to win that, that World Cup as a dark horse team. And so I'm like, God, you know, how is, is this possible? Can we do this? And they came after us. And, you know, in the beginning of the game, we had to weather the storm. But we we turned it around and did well. I mean, we really did. And so to pull that upset, like you said, it, it just gave it. We needed it. There was a lot of pressure on our shoulders there in hosting. I mean, we didn't have to qualify. You know, some teams around the world, some of the print around the world was just saying, God, what are we doing in a U.S. You know, nation when they really don't, it's not the culture, they don't love the game. So we had a lot to prove. Um, being knocked out against uh, Brazil 1-0 in that, that next round uh, was respectable, but I still think we could have done better. I was suspended for that game from two yellow cards. Um, unfortunately as well, my friend Tav Ramos, uh, we caught the elbow from Leonardo, uh, and he had come off the field. Um, but we did have some chances there. And I, I think if we had won that game and advanced in the next round, I think anything would have been possible for us. And that's not a far reach. That's not a stretch by any imagination because it, we did have the fans backing us and supporting us, which was brilliant. Um, yeah, it was a great time. And all this, as you said, led to the formation of the MLS just two years later. And you were part of the, the first season with DC United and subsequently played for the Revolution and uh, our other American co-host, Evan's local side, the Columbus Crew. Uh, what was the original vision for the league as presented to you? And where do you think MLS is now, uh, 20 years on? Um, yeah, I mean, look, uh, and, and just for the record, I, I enjoyed my time playing for the Columbus Crew as well. And Lamar Hunt, you know, God rest his soul, and uh, he was tremendous in terms of building the game. One of the founding fathers for us, you know, and, and building the crew and, and the first uh, soccer stadium there was, soccer-specific stadium. So we won an Open Cup for him, uh, which was brilliant, and now it's named after him. And so you talk about the crew through the game and Lamar Hunt, U.S. Open Cup trophy. And um, the vision and, and the way it was laid out for us is that, you know, there was going to be 10 teams, you know, across the nation. They wanted to grow it to 12 to 14 very quickly. Um, they were hoping they can get enough quality within each of the groups uh, to not only just kick off uh, the league, but they wanted to make sure that they had a, a three-year plan to, to survive and go through the adversity. And we didn't know what the fan base was going to do. What would the reaction be, you know, from corporate America as well? Would they take that on and would we get television rights and all that stuff? So, we were going into a lot of unknowns, um, but what they were selling to us that uh, it was going to be a domestic league. And I think they, they put all their chips in that basket, knowing that we grew up as players that, that were hungry, that had that chip on their shoulder, that wanted the respect um, and wanted the game to grow. I know I did. I was, you know, I'd always said that I wanted to stay in England for 10 years and play and then come back and develop, uh, help develop or be part of uh, the growth of the, the professional game in our country, you know, so we can set up for opportunities for the future. You know, uh, God, you know, you see my son get an opportunity to play for DC United in the last two years um, as a pro. And, uh, and and that was always, you know, uh, it was, was going to be a work in progress. Um, we knew that we were going to have to be salesmen for the league. Uh, all of us, and uh, we're going to have to be out in the community as much as possible, and and doing a lot of things for free, <laughs> really, because the budgets were lower. Um, but we sacrificed that because we wanted to have that one dream, and that dream of having a domestic league one day in our own country that we grew up in, that we can be proud of. And uh, God, fast forward to where we are today, you know, um, coming to the end of the 23rd season with so many clubs, 23 clubs right now in there and advancing and, and expansion again and the USL growing, you know, tremendously well. And that pyramid structure in our league, uh, in our country, just doing so well uh, and going strength to strength. So for me, it's, it, it was all worth it. And you look back and you're able to take a little pride in it and say, I always help part of that. So it's good. It's all very good. And I'm happy where we are today. 
So, of course, today the debate is now over things like the future direction of soccer in the U.S. and how league structures, finances, incentives for youth development should be managed. So what do you see as sort of the future of professional soccer in the U.S. going forward? God, I mean, that's you know, a, a loaded question. Uh, I think the main loaded question here, John, is, is like, are you for promotion and relegation in the U.S.? Do you think that's the future? Do you think it'll stay as it is? I think that is the future. I think we need to get to that stage at some point. Um, We do need to make sure that we have stability in the ownership groups across the board. We do not want to get to a point where we were similar to the NESL in those days. There was a lot of good and pros with that, but there was also a lot of cons and negatives um, in terms of the Wild Wild West and just outlandishly spending money uh, for no particular reason. There was no structure there. So we want to make sure that we have growth and slow growth um, so that there's longevity in the game. Um, And it's important. It's important to do that and to do it the right way. Um, You know, uh, to to put a lot of invested time and thought process into it. So I do like the fact that we are growing. I think getting more franchises um, that have stable ownership is incredibly important for the growth in this country, especially because of the, the country is so vast. Um, and and uh, I think there's room for more growth. Um, I'm excited about David Beckham, um, you know, and what he's trying to do in Miami and, and how he wants to get back in and, and give back to the uh, the game here in the, in the States, which he did so well for us. And back in 2007, when he came over and um, I had many conversations with him when he was here. He's a, he's a tremendous lad. Um, and I think he he helped lift our game to new heights, actually, because he is a brand in himself. Um, and he's global. And so that attraction to him, as well as what he was doing with the Galaxy and everything else, and the designated player rule and things like that, it helped change us. And, and there was a lot of complaints, and there was a lot of, God, working things out. It was never going to be easy. Uh, nothing was ever perfect and set in stone. So it was always trial and error. Um, but I do think that it's good that he's, he's coming back into the league and hopefully going to establish something in Miami. And, you know, same with some of the other ownership groups, you know, the, the established. Now, if you get to a point where we do expand enough and there's still the quality there, what you don't want to do is make a mistake like the NASL did and overrun all the teams. Uh, with so many foreign players. You want to make sure you're still creating opportunities for the American player. Um, And right now, that's a big concern for me. Uh, I see it becoming a difficult task for homegrown players through the academy system and through the college system, making a go at it and and getting an opportunity to really compete and grow here and play and learn. Um, You know, it's gotten to a point where it's win or loss columns, and I still don't understand why, because there isn't promotion relegation. So to be fair, if you finish last, you're okay. You come back the next year and you get rewarded for that. You, you get the top pick. You get this and that. You get allocation money. To me, it's 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 kind of strange. But look, at the end of the day, to answer your question, I, I would love to see our nation get to a point where there is promotion relegation. And maybe even within the USL. Um, I had some discussions with Jake Edwards, uh, the president of the uh, United Soccer Leagues, and I think he's doing a great job in growth here. Um, you know, with the championship and the restructuring and the rebranding of what we have now and the tier structure, maybe one day the USL League One gets strong enough and the expansion is strong enough where they can do it within the USL first, you know, within that league um, to the championship and back down promotion and relegation. So that could be an experiment three, four years down the road that major league soccer looks at and says okay it can work um because i think it creates that competition and it's 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 so many great st- story la- lines and the passion that's there for that as well uh, so those are some of the best games you know they really are you look at some of the teams that are you know in danger of being relegated and my god that do they fight they compete and it's it it's great entertainment it really is it is and i really would uh hope they do use that usl relationship they have with the mls now to kind of do those experiments like you say if we can make it work in in usl where there's not a lot of money flowing into it like there is in mls prove to mls that it works prove to mls that it's exciting just look at the success that the nation's leagues had by by uh, competitive uh, friendlies as such that's been much more interesting in the past like few months than any international friendlies been over the past 
like 10 years. So if they can see that even just a small um, reward at the end of it uh, or a small punishment at the end of it is is uh, improving the, the passion and the, the play of every game, then you won't have these games at the end of the MLS season like you have now where no one really matters. Nothing really matters about uh, whether they can get into the top six or not. Nothing really matters or happens if you get to the finish bottom of the league. It's it's, it's those consequences you need to uh, up really to uh, to make those games more worthwhile. I think actually that will drive more fans through the gates too. I agree. I agree. I think it will bring in a great deal more fans that are so used to that around the world, and uh, I think they would embrace it here for sure. And, and John, you, you mentioned USL with fondness. Um, it's an area where there's actually quite a lot of Wednesday alum and, uh, and Wednesday fans active uh, or have been active as well. We've got Lizzie Seedhouse, who's uh, obviously uh, very heavily involved in marketing uh, the league. Um, and uh, our own James O'Connor obviously had a, a real run of success with uh, with Louisville as well. Um, is that a vehicle by which you're able to kind of keep the your connection to Wednesday alive? And, and are, are there other kind of figures around US soccer today uh, who you keep in contact with in order to kind of give you a, a feel of how things are carrying on for Wednesday in the present tense? Yeah, I think we all try to connect uh, all the Wednesday I said here based in the States and certainly even doing the podcast with you guys and, and reminiscing back the old days. I think it's healthy. <laughs> it's good. Uh, you know, I keep in touch as much as possible. And even when I went back for the 150th um, anniversary celebration, that was pretty special as well. I mean, it, it just gives you an understanding and uh, a real true respect for the club to realize, like, God, how far we are in terms of the process of growth of the game in this country, when you go back to your club team and it's 150 years old, um, I, I think, you know, hey, it keeps things in perspective. But, yeah, there's so many great great fans that are here um, on Wednesdayites. And to be fair, I would love to, I guess, have more opportunities to, to spend time with the Wednesday fans that are here um, and go to some of these, you know, these... Uh, these game watching experiences and stuff like that. And uh, I was a little bit frustrated. I couldn't get the Sheffield Wednesday Derby County match on the other day. I just couldn't get it on. And, uh, <laughs> I, I think uh, I was, I was very frustrated. So yeah, I do anything I can to kind of stay in touch. And I got a lot of friends still in Sheffield that I, I reach out to and, you know, I talk to Chris Waddle quite often and uh, Chez, you know, with his coaching exploits and what he's doing and, and Nigel Pearson and I were texting back and forth obviously with the last or, um, sad situation that took place there, he and I, you know, stay in touch and stuff. So a lot of us from that generation do keep in touch with each other, which is very good. That's really great to hear. And John, anytime you're in one of our cities that have a meetup, by all means, get in touch. They would love to uh, host you. Um, as you know, we've uh, tried to get you down to New York Owls in a couple of times, but you moved to, um, are you living in Greenville now in that area or are you in DC still? I'm in Greenville uh, currently. I, um, you know, transitioning down here. I've been down here for the last two and a half months, and uh, you know, go back to uh, Fairfax, Virginia, um, to the house through the holidays and stuff. I was back there for Thanksgiving. Um, so yeah, down in Greenville now. So if there's any Wednesday nights down in Greenville or surrounding <laughs> area in South Carolina, get them out of the woodwork. Let's see the blue and white, the old strips, and let's, uh, you know, maybe even. Get a spotting of uh, Phil King in his in his yellow jersey where he disappeared like ginger. Um, you know, so, uh, <laughs> but the nearest we've got yeah. to Greenville is Charleston, South Carolina. We do have a meetup in South in Charleston, South Carolina. That's oh, the okay. match we were. Okay, good, very cool. So yeah, if you're down that area, place, give us a shout. Way. I definitely will. I definitely will. So um, you mentioned the 150th party, and we're very eager to uh, understand kind of any back backstage goss you got from that night. Uh, because was there any uh, re reunion with Josephine's in Sheffield, or, or a more modern version of Josephine's in Sheffield? <laughs> no, there wasn't actually. It was funny because uh, I mean there were so many great people there celebrating that night, and uh, of course it's open to the fans and the public, which is they should be part of that. They they were a big reason why we were successful so um the night was you know it, went, it was busy uh there was a lot of great people in there shaking hands and reminiscing uh some great photos as well and by the end of the night there was a couple of us that were just sitting there looking at each other at the table uh wondering you know where are we going <laughs> you know <laughs> to just to just kind of have a more intimate you know close kind of um you know talk and all that and so 
I remember Peter Shirtliff grabbed me at the bar and I was talking to some fans and he's like, Hoxie, come on, let's go. I go, where are we headed? And he goes, just jump in the taxi with us. We're going to go somewhere. We don't know where. <laughs> uh, we ended up going, we ended up going to, uh, I guess, a casino that's there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we went there and that was open. We knew it would be open, you know, kind of late in that. So um, we went there and Pearson and a couple of lads went out and had a few pints and everything and just kind of sat down and just, it was quiet. It was good. And just telling stories and, uh, you know, making fun of us, uh, making fun of each other and just uh, just connecting and just kind of, it was a good feeling. It was really nice. And uh, we, we had fun that night. It was great. Did Shezza return to the casino? Because I know he left a little bit early in the event. No, no, he did not. Do you know what happened to Shezza? <laughs> no, we just assumed that he'd had a bit too much and decided to leave. No, I had nothing to do with the drink. Oh, really? So he was no, he was in he was in the toilet, and he he was he was one of the lads that was going to come up on stage. I think Pearson was up there first, and I went up. I'm trying to think of maybe one or others or two others that came up, and. Uh, Shez was about to come up. So he went to the toilet. He goes, Hoxie, I'm going to go to the toilet first before you go up. I said, no worries, mate. So I went up and I, we couldn't find him. And then he finally came out of the toilet. A lad who was drunk, who was a fan, hit Shez's glass into his tooth and cracked his tooth in half in the front of his teeth. Oh, wow. That's horrible. So Shez couldn't speak. <laughs> okay, wow! I'm not kidding. He just it was knocked out, and he was like, like when he spoke, he's like, "You're speaker." Like, and we were all like, and we were looking at him like, "Is he pissed? Is he drunk?" And we're like, and that next day, Kingy <laughs> rang me up and he said, "Do you know what happened to Shez last night?" I said, "No, I had no idea." He goes, no, "I'm going to tell you," and he told me this story. I go, "You're joking." So I called Shez, and he was at the dentist. He had to get his teeth sorted. Oh out. wow! Well, and that's I'm glad we've story. said. We set the record straight at last on that one. I'm glad we. Uh, there you did... go. It's all set straight. And you got it here. <laughs> Exclusive. <laughs> Behind the scenes. Yeah, it's true. That is 100% true. Because we were all, even Gaffer, Ron Atkinson looked at me and goes, What's wrong with Chez? I said, well, <laughs> I have no idea. We couldn't find him. Uh, we couldn't find him that night. So we were all worried about him, but we found out he was okay. Oh, I hope the dentist bill wasn't too much for him. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. I think uh, we'll get Kingy to pay for that. First time he ever opened his wallet. <laughs> John, I think it's fair to say that we could we could literally do this all night long, and it's it's getting pretty late on the east coast. Um, but we do value your time, um, and uh, we've we've had so many questions for you that we thought we'd just kind of try and bring it to a close by um, by running through a few quick fire uh, questions, sure. if that's okay, just to kind of cross yeah. a few that off the, are on our list, um, but hopefully also to uh, to leave a few uh, items hanging for us to pick through the next time we have a chance to talk to you. So um, if it's okay with you, with you, we'll just ask you to give us some quick one word answers and then we'll we'll bring things to a close. Okay, I'll Fantastic. do my best. So um, in no particular order, who's your, the favourite player that you've ever played with? Uh, Chris Waddle. Uh, the favourite player you've played against? Uh, geez, wow. Brian Robson, uh, Ryan, uh, well, Ryan Gu, uh, Romario. Oh, nice. Romario. Wow, what, what an answer. Um, we, ha- we think we know the answer to this one, but you may have a, 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 an answer up your sleeve. Uh, what's the best goal you've ever scored? Uh, it was either a diving header at Blackburn or no, <laughs> the Darby, the Darby goal. Well, actually, I scored, I scored a crack and left footed goal, which not a lot of people really know. Uh, it was off a corner, and I think it was against Bristol City, maybe. Um, and it was it was a few weeks after, pretty. I think it was just after a cup or one of our cup games. And I come back to Hillsborough and I scored a left footed goal, top of the 18, upper 90. Uh, but I do love the Derby goal. Yes, of course. Scoring against Peter Schild was pretty special. Um, you know, he was he was tremendous. And uh, so that was that was pretty awesome. John, you've given us a very good reason for me to go digging into those old VHS tapes now to find out which goal that was. I'll, uh, I'll get back to you on that one. Um, this is where we get a little bit um, kind of transatlantic. Uh, apple pie or meat and potato pie? Oh, you're talking about two different things, you know. I'm a big <laughs> chef. I love, I'm a foodie in the kitchen. And, you know, the meat pie is fantastic. To have, uh, apple pie with French vanilla ice cream melted on top and heated up is pretty special. So I'm going to have to go with that. <laughs> 
I'm, I'm, I'm a US pie convert, but don't tell the folks back in Sheffield. Um, <laughs> the uh, the funniest Wednesday player in the dressing room in the, that 1991 season. Oh my God, I would have to say Phil King. <laughs> Phil my, King. My Waddle was pretty funny, actually. He was very sarcastic. We need to get Phil King on this podcast. He gets mentioned quite a lot as being a bit of a joke. He is brilliant. I mean, he was just quality. He really was. And uh, he and I hit it off again when we were on the uh, 150th anniversary thing. We were just telling stories and laughing. He's such a great lad. And I know he's got his own pub as well over there. I've never been to it, but I'd love to go. It's down in Swindon. Perhaps we'll have to have a, a, an Owls America's road trip to uh, the UK. <laughs> we'll, we'll take you with us, John. Um, yeah, the, my, best Swindon, my best Swindon accent is, put another log on driver. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's your best Swindon accent. I hate yeah, to hear your worst the one. best I could do. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's not very good. <laughs> Funny story. We had a Wednesday. It was born in Swindon down for the uh, for the game against Bolton this afternoon. But but uh, there we go. Uh, strange strange degrees of uh, serendipity. Uh, 1994 World Cup home or US US uh, sorry home or away US MNT kit. Uh, uh, home or away kit. Oh jeez. Yeah. Is that the denim kit? one? That denim one was absolutely horrendous when it first came <laughs> out. But everybody loves it now. Everybody loves it. Retro and, uh, niche. Isn't it? Right. I, I would guess that kit. Yeah, I guess looking back on it, the away kit was a red and white stripe, right? Um, yeah, I would say home kit for sure. Home kit. All right. So we've got one silly one and then one very serious one to bring us to a close, John. Um, if you're going for a haircut, would you uh, would you go in for a mullet or a short back and sides these days? <laughs> sure, sure, back and side, although I get asked many, many times frequently to bring back the mullet. It's it's still one of the quintessential Sheffield Wednesday haircuts, and um, I'm being more serious for a second. Uh, your your proudest moment in uh, in your soccer career? Signing my first professional contract with Sheffield Wednesday. Fantastic! Wow. What a uh, what a wonderful note to bring us to a close on, John. Um, we I don't think I, I speak for for Jeff and Paddy, but I think they'll both say the same thing, which has been that this has been an absolute pleasure, and we we very much hope that we'll be able to uh, continue the conversation with you about Wednesday for many years to come. But but thank you so much for your time this evening, gentlemen. It was a pleasure, and uh, thank you for allowing me to indulge in the history of the game again through Chef <laughs> Wednesday and with yourself. So anytime, I love the show, and uh, anytime you need me, I'd love to join it. And if awesome. you get Phil King on, I'll come on with Phil. Excellent. That's it. We're going to try and book Phil King now. Thanks, John, so much. Appreciate it. All right, guys. What you want to do is get the reunion, get five lads on at once (laughs) and stories and have a laugh. That would be fun. But that would be a three hour show. (laughs) Well, you you joke about that, John, but we've, um, if you're listening to the various Wednesday podcasts at the moment, there's one coming out, the uh, the Owl Sanctuary, which is going to be doing in depths with. Uh, with a few of your uh, your good friends so I think Chris Waddle is the first episode so maybe we'll have a word with those folks and see if we can get you all together in Sheffield for uh, for a, a long extended live edition at some point all right boys brilliant man love to love to listen for sure and uh, love love what you guys are doing so thank you so much I had a great time This has been episode 47 of the Owls Americas, Sheffield Wednesday Opinion with an American Accent. You can find us on the internet at owlsamericas.com, email the show at owlsamericas at gmail.com, and find and follow us on Twitter at Owls Americas. Our podcast intro and bumpers are by fellow Wednesday Ice Reverend and the Makers. The podcast is on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, Podbeam, and probably anywhere else you choose to download podcasts. There's no wrong way to listen to the show. Just do what feels right. Wherever you choose to consume the Owls Americast, we ask that you rate and review the show as it helps more Wednesdayites find our ramblings. And speaking of ramblings, you can leave the show a voicemail on our Dazed and Mumbled line at 1-401-307-1867. International rates do apply, but you can dial it for free using Google Voice. James is on Twitter at Manhattan Owl. Patty's on Twitter at Patty A. Jones and at New York Owl. I'm on Twitter at Jeff Paternostro. We'll be back later in the week with the usual non-John Harks nonsense.